Welcome to the Muscle Expert Podcast with Ben Pakulski, one of the world's top professional bodybuilders, an expert on human performance and mindset mastery. Ben dives deep to deliver the strategies of the top experts to upgrade your body, mind, muscle, strength, performance, biochemistry, and how to become the upgraded modern man. Join us on benpokolsky.com to learn the cutting edge techniques to take control of your body, your brain, and create your greatest life. What's up, ladies and gentlemen, Ben Pokolsky, Muscle Expert Podcast. Today, we're going deep on strength, strength accumulation, how to be world-class. Um, today's guest, Josh Bryant, is literally cha- training the best guys in the world when it comes to bench pressing and powerlifting. And Josh has been doing it for a long time. He was a world champion powerlifter himself. Um, he's wor- learned from the best. Um, he's extremely well-read, extremely well-researched, and he gives us golden nuggets, bombs, on how to accumulate strength, the biggest mistakes we're making, and the key mindset pieces that you're not thinking about that are derailing your fitness and strength journey. So go ahead and listen to this podcast. I know you're going to love it. Josh was great. Um, He literally held nothing back. So I hope you guys enjoy it. And as always, if you enjoy it, please leave us a share, leave us a review. We always appreciate that. Have a great day. So, man, let's just roll right into this because I want to talk to you about, uh, one, where this name came from, Jailhouse Strong, because I've heard some very interesting stories and, and, you know, how you've kind of evolved to be known as one of the number one guys in the world for teaching guys how to get super, super strong. Sure. So um, the thing with Jailhouse Strong was initially um, the gym we grew up in. There was a lot of different people coming in and out. It it was kind of like I was basically managing a hardcore gym when I was in high school. And so all these kind of rough different characters were coming in. It was amazing. And that's kind of around the, because this was in the nineties. So like late mid nineties and they were, that's when they took weights out in 92. So at that point, a lot of guys that had been in and out were really big. So we we're kind of, I was kind of just observing, picking things up and, and then it sort of came. So that was one way it came about. The other thing was um, my business partner, Don Machine and I were talking about like, just sort of how, how people are incarcerated. Like it, it may not be, like in literal form behind bars, but like it could be spiritually, it could be whatever else, other forms of incarceration. And we're trying to just figure out a way to help people, you know, become free. Good for you, man, dude, that that's so awesome. And I say one of the things I love about powerlifting and pure strength training is just how raw and primal it is, man. Like that's why I used to love lifting heavy. And that's why I'm sure it draws a lot of guys to it is like the just pure um like primal nature of it man like get under it and fucking do it and and man up or not right and it's it's so raw and primal um tell me something you do um that's unique because uh, i know literally i think all the best bench pressers in the world at one point have come to you for some advice or you've worked with sure um and so obviously you're doing something that's special and i want to give our listeners a really great um, insight into what josh bryant does better than everybody else Okay, so I think the the main thing I think one of the main things I've done, and and I'm sort of taking this opportunity because we have a lot of listeners here that I don't know why this has not caught on. I, cause I I'm not trying to keep it a secret is um, isometrics. So what I mean by isometrics and is um, specifically for strength training to overcome a sticking point because like the argument against isometrics can be okay. It only trains within fifth. It only strength is basically within fifteen to twenty degrees right. of the range of motion you're training. However, what the hell is a sticking point? <laughs> you know, that's that's like the perfect remedy because you're trying to um, – that's exactly what you want to happen. So sure. what we'll basically do is say – like let's just say for instance, they've worked best in bench press and in deadlift. Let's say in bench press you're um, sticking like two inches from lockout. Yep. Okay, So what you would do is put the bar in the pins, set the pins two inches from lockout. Um, you would just do, pretend like you're doing a normal bench press and on the way up, when you, when you come in contact with the pins, you start to exert maximal force. We hold that for six seconds. Okay. I mean, I, I shouldn't say hold it. You push as hard as you can for six seconds. Your whole objective is to try to like destroy the pins, mm-hmm. break them in pieces if you can. And then what we do, okay. So that's to attack that sticking point. And then the thing you might find interesting we do with it is we, we, um, about three minutes after. We'll do a compensatory acceleration training set as fast as possible in the bench press. So you do like a submaximal weight and you would do it as explosively as possible. So say you'd go from like that to like 70, 75% for, for a triple as explosively as possible. And because of that conditioning contraction prior, 
you're going to be, do it more explosively too. Yeah. So we're basically making, you know, we're making sure we're not just because there is a evidence if all you did is isometrics, you would kind of screw up the motor pattern, so to speak. Of course. Yep. But by doing that right after, I think we take care of both. And an interesting thing you might find too is uh, before Jeremy Hornstra hit one of his world records, it was um, actually in the two two seventy five pound weight class, but he he missed weight. He weighed like two forty four from 242 wow and it was turned out to be a disaster the whole day so i'm like dude we gotta like pull something out of our ass right here and, and make this happen so in the warm-up room before he did this world record put about 800 pounds on the bar and got me in the middle two guys on each side and we pushed down as hard as he can had him push as hard as he can for five seconds went on the platform broke the world record right so so are you familiar with jacques taylor he was a guest on my show a few weeks back and for any listeners should go check that out and jacques one of the best neurophys um, researchers in the world right now. He's actually one of these guys who just loves neurophysiology. So he's been in my gym a number of times, a great friend of mine, mm -hmm. and diving into deep into what's actually happening there at the physiological level. So what he, you know, one thing that I teach in my gym is the idea of activating a muscle before you train it. So one, we're improving the neurological efficiency and the motor pattern recruitment. Two, we're kind of cueing in the brain to that muscle. But what Jacques has gone and done, he's actually quantified um, the idea of excitation threshold uh, potentiation. So um, how can you get all of these motor neurons firing at the same time? And what he's showing is the best way definitively to do it is exactly what you're saying is in isometrics. And but he, what he recommends is doing it um, not for necessarily a set amount of time, because that can be very variable for people, sure. but doing it um, just short of exhaustion, because obviously what you don't want is you don't want to have you don't want exhaustion because that may take away from your performance. But what you want to see is right before you're about to hit exhaustion, as you can imagine, now your body's starting to get just a little bit of accumulated fatigue, and then it's here going, all the muscle fibers just start having to be recruited to sustain that isometric contraction. Right before you feel like it's about to fail, you stop. Um, and he's showing massive amounts of neurological potentiation in doing that type of training, man. So it's funny how success leaves clues. You've probably been doing it for a while, and he's quantifying it. Yeah, I mean, see, so I, I this was, I'd done this before. I just read some, came upon it by reading some old uh, mm -hmm. Russian training manuals and I, you know, they don't really cite sources in there. So I'm not sure on the exact experimentation, but I kind of changed it. What I thought just logically made sense yeah. for powerlifting. And I think it's sort of, I mean, you, I've heard you, a lot of stuff you talk about, I like is um, more for bodybuilding stuff is intention. I, I think that's huge. Cause I mean, they've shown if you, you know, if you just sit there and kind of make a mental movie of what you're going to do in the gym later, that there is some EMG activation that sure, way. Sure, but, you know, the idea of, of doing what you're doing, the isometric in particular ranges, makes a lot of sense because, yeah. you know, Jacques is, is specifically trying to – his focus is I want to activate this specific muscle. So if it's quads – I'm going to take them you know, relatively close to their mid-range where I know they're going to be strongest. I'm going to put as much effort as I can until they start to fatigue. Where in your case, if you pick a specific range, even though most people would associate like a bench press with the pecs, it may actually not be the pecs that you need to potentiate to get that movement finished. Because sure. you know, the pecs are going to do most of the work at the bottom half of the range and the triceps are going to finish it. Um, so the idea is maybe you're actually activating the triceps more than you're activating the pecs. So doing the range-specific stuff I think makes a ton of sense. It's it's worked so well. That's why I'm I'm sort of surprised it hasn't gotten more popular. But yeah, man. So tell me what a training block looks like. So you know, Josh, I I, I want to come to you and I want to go from let's say a you know 300 pound bench press. I want to go to 450. Um, what do we got to do and how long is it going to take me? It's gonna it's gonna. Uh, I mean, as someone like you would know, it's for sure gonna be like totally individualized on how long yeah. it can take because I mean, just you know, how, your genetics, uh, your commitment, lifestyle, all that kind of stuff. And then, of course, so, um, but basically, um, we could go like, so what I could do is we were going to peek you out, say, let's just say like, this is just pretty straightforward case. We would go um, somewhere like a 12 week, say, peaking cycle to get your bench up. And then what we do in the off season is, um, you know, th that's where we really work on building more volume, uh, building work capacity and, and really focusing on a lot of weaknesses at that point. And then, you know, do that for say, it could, it could range anywhere from, you know, four to up to 10, 12 weeks and then go back to another peaking cycle. And, and that's, and unless it's somebody that's never trained that way, cause I've had people that like, say they come from more of a bodybuilding background. Mm -hmm. They've never trained for strength before. Yep. We can run successive strength style, style um, programs for quite a while without hitting a plateau. And if, if that's going to be the case, we're going to take the momentum and go with it where, you know, if it's somebody more advanced that obviously if, you know, I always joke if you add five pounds a week to your bench and you're doing the bar right now, you know, in three in three years from now, you're, you're 100 pounds over the world record. Right. So obviously I didn't work 
Right. <laughs> so that's kind of how we roll like that. Cool, man. So tell me about uh, like uh, how much you're looking at the way people are doing it. So movement patterns, is that a consideration? How much are you taking in individual structure um, and execution into this? Or is it is most of what you're looking at from a periodization perspective? It's going to be both because a lot of it's going to be from more of a periodization um, aspect because um, a lot of people that are coming to me are already pretty, pretty advanced sure. in what they're yeah. doing. So, you know, that, like say – you know, you're benching, you know, a world record, but now you want to set that world record higher. Uh, you know, it's going to be different than somebody, Hey, you know, I've benched 185 and come to me. Then, then we got a little more wiggle room with, with like the actual movement pattern mm -hmm. and whatnot. And a lot of it is becomes, as I'm sure this would make sense to you is, you know, getting the movement pattern more efficient is like, that's one, th one of the beauties of, of the bench press is you can build yourself to bench press mm -hmm. where a deadlift, you cannot elongate your arms sure, and things sure. like that. So you can actually build yourself to bench press. So if you have a terrible build for bench press, you can actually make it somewhat okay with years of hard work where other lifts, you can't do that. Uh, amazing, man. So what are some of the biggest levers people can, can pull to really move the needle on their strength? So, you know, let's say we're looking at a bench press, um, you know, someone comes to you or, or what do you see on average, uh, you know, on mass that people are doing that, you know, if they just did these one or two th things, they could really accelerate their progress. Okay. I think one of the biggest things is um, building power out of the bottom. Yeah. Because like, as, you know, my mentor, the late uh, Dr. Fred Hatfield yep. said, you know, he's talking about compensatory acceleration. So you can basically, you know, if you get the bar moving fast enough, you can outrun any potential sticking point, you know, even if your technique's off a little bit. So I think Absolutely. that's where a lot of people are not getting it right off the bat if they could build like so one one movement we like to do to help with that is what i call a dead bench okay so it's just a pen press you know say start the um yep the bar about ah eh, like it's going to range over from like an inch to, to three inches depending because obviously the only advantage a tall person has in a bench press they got a longer eccentric better stretch reflex so um if you're taller you'd put a little further off your, your chest but anyways what you do is you just push the weight bottom up concentric only for singles and that's a great way to help build, you know, that power out of the bottom. So things like that, I think if most people could build power out of the bottom, they're going to be um, really far ahead of, of other people for the most part. How much, are you, how much are you incorporating bands and chains as far as accommodating resistance in this stuff? Because it seems to me as far as that acceleration um, consideration, that would be a huge benefit. It is a big benefit. So um, it's going to it's going to depend on a number of factors, but um, it's definitely. But here's here's the kicker: is we, we like, for instance, like uh, I think the best example of this is is actually with squat. But um, if you start using too many bands, they become like your own built-in Smith machine. They actually actually add stabilization because you get so sure. used to them. So yep. we have to not. I, I mean, because I didn't experiment before, I knew any sort of I've like any the my scientific knowledge was you know, Fred Hatfield's books at that right. point. And that was it. I hadn't studied it all myself besides that. And when I was a kid and I'd noticed when, um, I'd train squats with bands for like a too long of a cycle. I it felt like naked at the bottom of the squat when I took them off, you know, I get like, it was because I don't know, maybe that enhanced eccentric. There was like getting such a good propel me out of the bottom so well that, you know, it, it wouldn't, it, when you took them away, it was totally different. So, so you're talking like reverse bands specifically. I was talking regular okay. bands too, like bottom up. So both. So I like them, but here, here I guess basically I call them a supplement, not a substitute. Sure. So yeah, absolutely. 100% we use them, but they're never like other people would be more advocate of like, that's our main movement. And you know, we're, it, it's going to, it's going to change the dynamic a bit. So we're more of a, we're supplement, not substitute. Brilliant, man. So, you know, from my perspective, I deal with a lot of people who want to get strong and, uh, uh -huh. the way I will address it, a lot of people is looking for those inefficiencies in, in the bench pressing first, making sure their form is right to prevent injuries. So definitely is injury something that you uh, run into a lot. And if so, what are you doing to, what are your best strategies to combat those? surprisingly not. So I think we've had some pretty good strategies to combat them because, um, my theory is the bench press record right now, raw, the mo you know, that, so people if don't know what the difference is. It means like no supportive shirts or anything. Right. It just sounds fucking cool, man. Just, just say raw and people yeah, don't need to know what raw. it is. <laughs> <laughs> just, so it's 738 guy weighs about 400 pounds and that that's, that's the best ever. Right. So what's his name, Josh? Sorry. What's that guy's name? That's uh Kirill from Russia. Uh, okay. He's a squatter too, isn't he? Uh, he's a bench press specialist primarily, okay. but he's, he's all around strong for okay. sure. And, um, the guy I said about earlier, yeah. uh, Jeremy Hornster, in my opinion, 
um, I think he's the best of all time because he's uh, hit a six. First of all, he's been hitting world records since 2006, and now we're in 2018. Second off, he's um, – you put in perspective, so that's 738, and I don't want to exaggerate, but weighing about 400. Yep. Where Jeremy's a 672, weighing 241. Jeez, that's nuts. Is he, is he trending to your gym there in Metroflex? No, actually, we work uh, together online. So um, what we'll do is he'll send me a lot of videos and things like yeah. that. We do you know a lot of phone stuff. So, um, But uh, anyway, so a lot of stuff I think that's helped is um, – one of the main things I think besides like just strategies, we don't major in the minors. So for instance, I've had elbow surgeries because I went too heavy on arm stuff when I was powerlifting. And I, I'd see like, say like, for instance, you know, Kazmaier did 315 for 15 on a skull crusher. Okay. I'm going to have to do 320, you know, that type of mentality. Sure. And it was really stupid because it became, it, it was no longer a means to an end. It became, a, it just becoming filled by ego and not doing what you need to do to get the job done. And it was really stupid. And, and you're, and you're built very differently than Kazmaier, man. So the, <laughs> that, that's, yeah, yeah, no, totally. Yeah, some exercise that fit you aren't going to fit him. Right. Vice versa. Absolutely. So that's, yeah. So that's been a cue thing though, is like realizing everything we're doing is a means to an end. So that applying that mentality to whatever we're doing, I think is the biggest injury prevention because I mean, there becomes a certain point where, you know, Somebody the other day was talking about, I want to get my overhead press up to 500 pounds. What, what's your main goal? Bench press 650, okay? So why do you want to do that? Right. You know, you know, it's just because you want to do it. Fine, I can accept that, but then realize we're taking away over here because, you know, everything's got a cost. Man, that's, it's, you know, that's brilliant, right? There's so much to be learned in that because, you know, I get a lot of people that come to me and say, oh, my goal for 2018 is I want to read a book a week. And, and you go, well, why do you want to read a book a week? And they say, well, because I think that will get me, you know, something that, um, you know, I, I associate with reading a book a week and I'm like, well, you need to have a very specific goal. Otherwise, how do you know which books to read? How do you know what you're going deep on? Right. The idea of like, if you're trying to become a master of something, become the master of something. But if you're just trying to do something because it sounds cool, because someone else set that goal, uh, you have to, you have to kind of look at it and go, Hey man, wh what is it? Where is this taking me? Right. And why am I setting this goal for myself? Sure. And then I'm looking at like, it's funny you say, cause I'm looking right here at my desk. Someone gave me this book called the seven laws of coaching. I haven't read it yet. 35 pages i could you know i could read that in probably 15 minutes today so is that the same as reading war and peace <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah well yeah whatever the objective is but i mean maybe you're better off suited saying hey i want to read 50 books on you know mastery of coaching and leadership this year and become a master of that and sure. that, that's one thing that's a very um, worthwhile endeavor rather than just saying you know i want to read um 53 curious george books this year right like ha having a having a kind yeah. of a vague objective with no real endpoint is sometimes silly and that's where people go wrong with this whole idea of goal setting setting the goal to bench press or to, to pe press 500 pounds overhead is you know great if it's something your ego wants to brag about but kind of useless is useless in the big picture yeah and that's what i was saying that's what i was saying like hey man here's the bottom line i work for you if that's your goal We'll do it. I'm just going to make you think about why you want to do it. Then he came back and said, oh, you're right. You know, that, that is, we don't need to do that. So, okay. Brilliant, man. You know, I'm all for, I'm all for anybody's goal. If that's their real goal and they thought <laughs> it out, he's like, I don't care if I bench press 650, like a 600 pound bench press and a 500 pound over press would mean more to me. Great. Let's do it. Yeah, absolutely, man. So tell me why strength, Josh, what is it about strength training and, and getting strong that draws you to that? Um, well, I think a lot of it is just uh, first off was being uh, would be is just being naturally good at it. So I think um, I started off really young. So at five years old, my dad could play racquetball at the YMCA. I'd sneak in the weight room until I got kicked out and that kind of stuff. <laughs> That's so awesome. And then so I think I had good genetics for it. Yeah. Then I also just got into it. I mean, I'm managing a hardcore gym at 16 years old. Well, not by accident, I'm sure. Not by accident. So that, you know, I think that's a lot of it is I is just and then um, for one, then I started getting into helping other people at the gym because, you know, I'm you know, if I'm 16 years old, I'm making better gains than people that are 30, you know, 30 years old, 35 years old. They're starting to say, hey, can you write these programs for me and stuff and this? So I'm helping other people training, getting stronger. And it was just sort of at first, it wasn't even like a real goal. It just kind of like happened i guess by like doing the right stuff whether i knew if there was an end purpose or not then it became okay this is how i can actually make a living and this is like my passion type of thing 
Hey guys, I interrupt the podcast to bring you a message from our sponsor, ATP Labs. And our feature product of the week is Estro Control, which has quickly become one of our best selling products, both to men and women. Even though it looks pink and you may think it's a predominantly female product, I actually recommend it to a lot of my male clients. Um, we're exposed to so many environmental estrogens, so many xenoestrogens in our drinking water, in a plastic bottles, and anything we eat that's plastic can expose our body to potentially dangerous xenoestrogens. And estrogen control is a proven formula to help our body start to eliminate these xenoestrogens. So another way you can do it is with infrared saunas, but I recommend adding estro control for anybody who, who's noticing potentially decreased testosterone ratios, uh, potentially accumulated additional fat around your body bottom and your lower half and your thighs, uh, that can often be indicative of elevated estrogen. So if you're someone who experiences some of those symptoms, head over to ATP Lab right now, check that out. Uh, Estro Control is the product. And because you're cool and because I love you, use the code BEN10 and get 10% off. And if you sign up for their VIP newsletter, you will also get free shipping. So that's super cool. 10% and free shipping. Sign up for the newsletter. Back to the episode. Enjoy. Getting back to the question asked earlier uh, with a little bit different preface, it seems as though the world records keep getting broken. And um, I'm curious mm -hmm. as to what you think the biggest levers are there where, you know, what are the top guys in the world doing right now to leverage their um, continuous quest for breaking world records? I think there's two main things, and this is uh, probably not going to be a, the coolest answer, no. but there, there's uh, standards are higher. Yeah. Four minute mile, man, right? Roger Bannister. That's, I think that then we have more people doing it. So the thing is like, for instance, like I, I heard the USPA, that's uh, one of the more pop, post, most popular federation in, in the United States. There's, you know, cause it's different than bodybuilding. Bodybuilding, you might have a few federations, you got your natural one, your non-tested, blah, 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 but not like hundreds. Right. Power often you got dozens of federations. So you could have someone, you know, you've ever met somebody It's like, I'm a world record holder in bench press. You're like, dude, you weigh 230 in bench press 319. Like, you know, what world are you living <laughs> right. in? You know, they made up their own federation. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so that happened. So I think, um, but if you look at the number, my point being that somebody told me in the USP, I, I haven't verified this, but there was like 30 some thousand people in it, in that one federation. So if you start doing the math of all these different federations, there's got to be, you know, hundreds of thousands of people competing were in, you know, like the late nineties, I believe I heard, I'd read, a, I think it was about 30,000 people competing. So I think we have more numbers. And then of course, um, I think there's been the biggest thing is that as a transition to real, uh, training, better quality training, because a lot of, for basically for people who don't know, powerlifting was primarily equipped up to about 2006. Okay. So that means people wore like squat suits and bench shirts that basically, help them lift a lot more weight than they could do on their own. Right. Around by about 2012, it had definitely switched to a vast majority, you know, it was raw. So here was kind of the disconnect though. Even like a few years ago, a lot of like you go on certain websites and they would have an article about bench press training, but it was, it was geared towards pun intended someone wearing gear. Right. So it didn't make, it didn't make sense to like, okay. So like I said earlier, what's the main thing, you know, like building power to the bottom. So at the time, you know, you write an article and talk about the dead bench press and people read it and their bench press goes with 50 pounds. You know, you look like a genius type of thing. And the thing was, it was like, I think now there's more. So now we have people in the sport that don't know about when it was in equipment and, and, and gear. They, so they don't even know that that ever existed. So like raw is the way to do it now. So there's point being the people that are experts are actually putting out quality information instead of, a totally different sport, essentially. So I think that's been huge. Sure. I mean, that would be a totally different sport, right? I mean, raw compared to, to equipped, from my perspective, as far as how we should be trained for, be obviously very, very different. Be totally different, oh, yeah. 100%, you know, yeah. Even nutritionally very different. So segue into a nutrition conversation, man. So I recently did a conversation um, podcast with Dr. Zach Bush, and it was one of the best podcasts I've ever done because he really got into the future of nutrition for an elite athlete. So I'm curious what, uh -huh. um, you know, at what level, powerlifters, you know, I guess historically are known as just guys who eat everything and, and um, <laughs> just try to, you know, let's, hey, man, let's get as many calories as we want because, you know, McDonald's apple pies taste good. Um, how much of a consideration are you, t are you taking into, you know, actually fueling these guys, um, in a healthful way or, or from your perspective, is it just best, Hey, we just need to get calories. No, it's, it's definitely, it can't be just that because I mean, obviously, unless you're a super heavyweight, 
you have to take, you, you want to maximize your composition. So you, you're going to perform your best. So it'd be one thing if somebody's like, you know, say, you know, I'm, I'm, there's going to be people where that it's more of that type of mentality, but all these guys that are like you know, 275s, 242s, I mean, they're not lean like bodybuilders, but they're a lot leaner than like your typical apple pie eating powerlifter. So there is definitely um, a good consideration there uh, of nutrition and um, the strategies vary. So a lot of these guys I've found even like, you know, sometimes a lot of the real, you know, when we're getting like, say someone's going to 308 pound class from a super heavyweight. We'll even use like a ketogenic approach because I found like a lot of the guys that are really fat, they can perform really well on that. Well, dude, uh, looking at it from an energetics perspective, a powerlifter doesn't use a lot of carbohydrate. They certainly don't need a lot, sure. <laughs> especially, you know, the, the the idea of I need to take a pre-workout shake and a post-workout shake and like, but you're doing a total of 12 reps, you know, over, over spaced over two hours. Um, yeah, so totally. logically that makes a lot of sense, man. So tell me about that. So I, I've read a little bit about what you're doing, um, segueing, I'm guessing yourself personally into ketogenic dieting and potentially, um, influencing yeah. a lot of your guys to do keto. Yeah. So I'm, I'm definitely, you know, I've just, um, cause I, I first kind of got, I got introduced to it actually in a sense of like, you know, at least a low carbohydrate perspective, um, in, in, um, having to make weight for a power off to meet in 1999. Right. I had, uh, I read Atkins book. And I'm like, okay, this is, actually worked pretty well right. for me. So um, definitely haven't become like a zealot because I feel like that's sort of like the, that's sort of the problem. You know, I mean, like with like it's like you know, how do you know you know when someone's a keto or vegan and you know in a bar because they're, they're going to tell you type of thing. It's right. like they feel like a, a need to like make it like sort of like a, like you said, read 53 books. It's more about like just being part of a group than actually effective results. Mm -hmm. So I think, um, but a, a lot of guys have had, you know, done some experiments too of like, uh, cyclical ketogenic diets too, where we're strategically placing some carbs within the workout and right after, and they're, they're, they're actually right back into keto pretty quickly. Yeah, absolutely. You know, according, absolutely. So, um, energetically, I mean, your biggest concern as a power lifter is like, Hey, how can I amp up my nervous system? And, and I, I think that probably the last thing you want to do is take a bunch of carbs before you train. Cause that's just going to give you a serotonin spike, right? You're, you're looking for things to amp up dopamine and acetylcholine pre-workout, um, carbs, pre-workout, yep. you know, serotonin going to make you sleepy and take away that neural drive. So, you know, anybody out there looking to optimize their, their strength training, do you have any hacks, um, you know, supplementally or otherwise that you look at, um, using to fuel workout like pre-workout? Um, primarily with that pre-workout, it's going to be like, you know, caffeine or some sort of stimulant like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, so yeah, what dose, not so Josh? much. Come on, I've, man. You got to give me some, give me some juice here. Give me some dosages. I know you guys are doing some fun stuff on the big days. Yeah, no, you know, anywhere from like, you know, 300 on a lower end up to like five to 600. Yeah. Yeah. So not like, you know, body weight dependent. Like, by the way, I'm not sniffing coke, not fun like sniffing coke or something. Right. No, 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 no. <laughs> I'm just no, I, yeah, I'm looking for, um, you know, so if, if I was going into a, a powerlifting workout, I'd probably be taking 1,200 milligrams of alpha GPC, a bunch of L-DOPA, a bunch of tyrosine, a bunch of caffeine, just to get my dopamine cranking through the ceiling. I'd be an angry mofo, but I'd probably lift 10 to 20 percent more. You know, that's, that's sure. yeah. So for me, like, I'm all about hacking my brain chemistry and being like, hey, man, how can we you know, artificially for this short period of time, make me think that I'm invincible and I can smash my head through this wall while I go ahead and squat this seven or 800 pounds, you know? Do, you had a powerlifting background too, didn't you? Like back in, uh, man, yeah, I did. Really and, and, yeah, I just like to lift heavy shit when I was in college, man. I probably th trained three times a week. So usually that was what resembled the powerlifting workout was probably a squat, deadlift, bench press and shoulder press type thing. And maybe I'd do some, you know, one pull up. <laughs> um, I wasn't. Well, I'd heard you had some real good numbers. I think it might have been Richard Fiker or somebody that had told me that. Yeah, man. I, I You know, when I was 21, I was doing 750 for triple on deadlift. Uh, squat, I could do about the huge. same. Um, but that goes away really fast, right? Like, <laughs> I can't do anywhere near that anymore I, with, with age and accumulation of uh, variable uh, injuries and inflammation stuff. Um, you know, obviously, my, my goals are very different now. But back then, I just love to lift sure. heavy shit, man. So, um, I, you know, it was definitely something I like doing. Absolutely. Not something I like to talk about, though. Because, I mean, it wasn't pretty, right? It was like I had big balls and, and a, probably a stupid brain. <laughs> so it's Probably fun, though. Oh, yeah, man. Oh, that's exactly And I still love to go watch powerlifting because <laughs> I, I look at it and I'm like, man, I want to do it again. Like, I want to get under those big weights. And, and just like for people who haven't done it, man, like the, the rush that you get of, of, man, I could either be crushed under this shit. Like, either I'm going to succeed or it's going to be fucking brutal in the process. 
Um, so yeah, man, it's such a, I think it's such a great feeling. The focus. So yeah. it's like a thing of like people aren't present in the present moment and you have no choice, but to be, you know, cause if you're doing like, say, you know, cable flies, it, you obviously should be focused on what you're doing, but you could get away with like just having a side conversation, but if you're trying to squat 800 pounds. You're not going to be talking about anything else or anything. You're focused 100% on what you're doing. I think that's, and there's so little of so many people aren't focused on the present moment right now. I think that's like their way of kind of like they're so they're sort of like crypto meditation. <laughs> uh, no, brilliant, man. So tell me about that. So, you know, I've been around a lot of high level athletes, a lot of high level powerlifters, bodybuilders, and the difference between the guys who nobody knows and the guys who are literally world class, world champions, and everybody knows their name is minuscule. It's literally minutia. Uh, and from sure. my perspective, it's often just what's going on in their mind, what's going on in their brain. You know, do you believe you, you are worthy of this? Do you believe you deserve it? Um, you know, are, are you 100% focused and committed? Tell, tell me about that, man. So what are your best yeah. strategies and what do you think separates the men from the boys to use that uh, term? I think some of the um, so some of the best strategies we've had is um, is uh, so, so there's a lot of them. So I actually I actually wrote a, a best-selling book and it's called The Successful Mindset, Jailhouse Strong Successful Mindset. Co-authored it and it was very focused on on this type of subject. So um, great. What I've done a lot of is um, a couple is um, so I'm actually first one I like to do with people is this. Uh, I'm sure you can appreciate this is um, just to get them like get their head right is start them off like say hey let's start doing a gratitude journal for you. So I'm gonna have you write down five or ten things you're thankful for every morning. Let's do this for a few weeks and see how you feel. And it's all of a sudden, everybody does it. They're like, I'm feeling better, you know? So I think that kind of gets their mind, like you said, like they're worthy of it and that type of thing to kind of like, it's almost like that's the detox. And then we get into more specific strategies. Right. Brilliant. So I'm all about like writing it down, writing down what your goals are huge on that. And uh, preferably daily saying them out loud. And then a lot of it's with, um, mental movies and, um, bordering on hypnosis. So what we'll do is, um, just basically, um, so a couple different, what I used to do, what I used to personally do, and I found out this kind of got me too hyped up is, um, so my goal was my proudest strength accomplishment too, was, um, most people think it's bench being the youngest at the time to bench press 600. And that's not actually it. It's, it's deadlifting 810 because, you know, by my build, I have a terrible, like real short arms and things like that. I'm not built to deadlift. Right. So I had to work extremely hard at it. So what I used to do is I would go into the garage and I'd load up 800 pounds on, on the, on the bar and I'd sit there and stare at it. And I'd get so excited. I'd run up and like grab the bar and I wouldn't lift it, but I'd run up and like grab the bar and, you know, it was supposed to be for like 15 minutes. All of a sudden you look at the clock, it's two hours later type of thing. The, the problem was there was like getting, you know, it was getting too much fatigue from that because it was like becoming too much of a real experience where I'm actually like feeling it. And like, I'm, sh I'm sure, you know, just be, so then, um, what I started doing more was and using with other people is have them, um, you know, use more mental movies. So I, I used to say visualization, but I said mental movies, like actually integrating all the senses and just all the senses, absolutely all the senses, man. So, and then, um, another one is, is, um, is the affirmation. So like, for instance, Steve Johnson just broke the American deadlift record, um, with nine Oh nine. So, and he, it was almost silly. Him and I are probably the only people that thought he was capable of doing that because his best was eight forty eight at the time, which at an elite level, that's a huge, uh, difference. Huge. You know, the, so, so you say, I, I'd have him say, um, I give myself permission to deadlift over 900 pounds. And he'd say that I'd say, all right, you're going to say that you know, every day when you see yourself in the mirror and as you go to sleep, you just, that's it. You're going to say that mantra to yourself that, real man. slowly. Yeah. You say it real slowly and, and that kind of thing. And it was just like embedded into them. So those are the kind of strategies I've uh, used really well. And I've, I've been studying this a lot. So I feel like, I mean, I, I think it's sort of cutting edge in a sense, but Honestly, the more uh, it's not like anything else. The more I learn about this stuff, the the more I realize I don't know. <laughs> you know what I yeah, mean? Absolutely. Like, just it's. I don't feel like I got it figured out. I feel like I've used some stuff that's effective, but I don't think I'm close to knowing enough yet. I'm gonna I'm gonna connect you with Jacques Taylor, man. That's the guy I was talking about a little bit earlier. So I had I, love that. I, I hit him on the podcast, and I said I said Jacques, um, 
you know, I'm going to present a scenario to you. So I've got a guy who, a uh, completely fabricated scenario, but I've got a guy who uh, is a world-class powerlifter, and he's at a plateau, can't break through his plateau. Um, you know, he's, he's been manipulating all the variables of exercise. His form is effectively perfect. His nutrition is great. His recovery is great. Um, what uh, lever do you pull to move his lift? And he pulled something out of the air that I was never expecting. He said, well question I'm going to ask him is, where's your mindset as you walk up to that bar? And where's your mindset as you come into the gym? Um, I said, okay, well, tell me more about that. And he, so he, he basically started diving into the idea of he needs someone to be in a happy, positive, enthusiastic state of mind. If, if, and he got into it from not just like, you know, woo woo, like you need to be positive. He got into it from a neurochemical level as far as um, creating BDNF and allowing this um, you know, the neuroplasticity to occur in the brain that requires you to recruit more motor neurons. And I was like, dude, this is exactly the kind of answer that everyone needs to hear. It was, it was really truthfully uh, amazing. And I think, you know, you're right on the right track. And he's just, he's just quantifying it with science, right? He's just being like, hey, if we do this, you know, this is actually what's happening inside your brain to make that more likely to happen. And that's interesting because that's sort of how it's gone with training too, is like, okay, when I was younger, didn't have much science to back it. It's kind of like, this is what works. And, yeah. you know, now you see stuff to back it, but hopefully it'd be cool to learn more about this to actually have some science stuff to back it too, rather than just, okay, so-and-so pulled the record. So we know it works. Yay. You know, it'd be nice to actually. <laughs> Man, I, I always, I always say like one of my, one of my favorite quotes that people always throw out about me is, you know, before we're 30, we're 30, we train with our balls. After we're 30, we train with our brains because, at some point when you keep training with your balls, your body breaks. <laughs> so there's no mind. Sure. It's just like, I'm just going to lift hard. I'm just going to do everything that, you know, I'm going to kind of figure out what works for me. And by the time you hit 30, you've, you've broken yourself enough times to realize, okay, now I can start actually using some intelligent approach with some rhyme or reason rather than just arbitrarily, you know, taking my balls out of my purse and, and, and having at it. <laughs> yeah. I a hundred percent with you on that. Yeah, man. So it, it's an interesting um, kind of, transcendence of process and the same thing happens in bodybuilding man you know thousands of bodybuilders out there you know either before 25 or before 30 they think they know everything they hit 30 and they're like man my body's broken what do i do uh, and then they always come around and start realizing there's, there's an intelligent approach and something something wiser you could be applying and, and implementing to move the needle rather than um you know having to just work hard if working hard is the only solution you're in big trouble um so man yeah, and there'd be a lot more people that are more successful. Than exactly. And people are going to, you know, the idea of work, hard work is great, man, but um, there has to be other levers to move. Otherwise, um, you know, you're going to run into a wall. It's only so hard you can work before you break, and you have to learn how to fluctuate those stimuli. And that's something I want to talk to you about is, um, you know, how how do you strategically progress the, the different types of stimulus you're subjecting somebody to? Because obviously it's not just about – five extra pounds per week, although that would be the greatest scenario in the world. Um, so what does it, what does it look like when somebody comes to you and says, Hey man, you know, I want to get strong. Walk me down that path of, um, you know, okay, Hey, I'm not putting those five pounds on, um, anymore on the, on this bench press or this deadlift. Um, what are some of the strategies you start implementing to, um, to change it? So, you know, give me an idea of what maybe a, an immediate change would be or a four week block or an eight week block. Yeah. So a lot of times what we can actually get away with is progressively adding those, you know, five pounds, say when we're getting into a meat prep, mm -hmm. because we've take care of a lot of the work in the off season. So then it's, you get that period of time where you can kind of get those, I don't want to say newbie type games of more that direction because you've taken care of business in the off season. Yes, man. And then the other one is, I think it's funny is, uh, Bill Kazmar and I were talking about this uh, a little while ago and you know, he's a, I don't know what his scientific training is, but he's a very, very intelligent man. Yep. And, um, is like, just start looking at every variable. So you might look at, um, you know, like just say rest period. So like, let's just say one of your accessory movements is you're doing, you know, a decline tricep extension with dumbbells. Okay. You're doing five sets of 12, you rest 90 seconds in between each set. Okay. What if you, instead of trying to add five pounds that cut the rest next week down to 75 seconds, you know, cause we can increase, we can increase the intensity of the training that way. So we have to start looking at every single little variable, like rest periods, things like that. Absolutely. And we can progress it that way. You know, then we can, you know, but a lot of it's when you go to that off season and you prepare yourself, it, it's not, it, it's not usually no matter what the level you can get away with a lot of just a linear progression up into the meat. Man. So one of the things that I teach here is basically yeah. you have three, you have three dials, right? 
you have a strength yep. and neurological training, you have a hypertrophy training, and you have a, a metabolic or a fat loss training. And, and at any time, you should be dialing up one or two of those dials, but not three. Um, and that way, one of them is always being deloaded. And you always have some room to progress in that one that's that's um, being deloaded, right? So when you hit the kind of the sure. capacity of the of the one you're training, you can always switch it. And it sounds like that's exactly what you're getting into is just like, hey, if, I, if I'm really pushing this neurological stimulus, and I'm not really seeing it move anymore, well, I'm going to back up on that one and turn up one of the volume on one of the other ones. So tell me about what this off season looked like, because what you said there was brilliant, man, like how you can go into a contest prep, um, or a, a lift prep and a meat prep and actually experience newbie gains. Cause this is, this is something that I'm familiar with and I'd love to hear your, um, your expertise. Well, it's, it's, it's a couple of things because you're starting out, you're going to, you're obviously just what you're saying. So you've worked those other capacities. So this one that you've been sort of neglecting is going to be wide open for a new stimulus. And for two, um, you've kind of, you're going to, you're going to set it back. So let's just say for you, you want to, you know, we're 12 weeks away from meat and you're going to, um, you want to deadlift 850. Well, what if we just start you off at like, say like 700 for three pounds for three reps or something like that? We can actually, uh, we can progress it up quite a bit. Cause we're not, we're not picking up like, okay, the first week from this off season into the meat prep, we're not just coming at you with like all you could do. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to dial it back a little bit and build some momentum. So that's where the compensatory acceleration training comes in effect too, because all of a sudden you're maximize you want to maximize every single rep every single set type of thing so what you do is you're transitioning from you have a new stimulus introduced because you've kind of basically like you said deloaded that particular quality you're training that and then you're not starting at where you would be maxed out at so those two together build you momentum and then it, for a few months you should be able to ride that tr that gains train and take it right in the meat and hit a huge pr but it just can't do that year round brilliant man um now Going into the weeds a little bit about um, the necessity or the involvement of cutting edge um, drugs in the sport. So we don't have to get into steroid talk, but I know peptides sure. is, is a huge thing now. Um, do you think that's become a factor in guys being able to break records or maybe just be able to save their bodies? And how, how prevalent do you think it is in um, or do you know that it is in powerlifting? It's, it's pretty, it's pretty prevalent with yeah. people. So I think what it, it, I think what you said is both true because if you're saving your body, you're more likely to hit records. Like I've yeah. said, I, I was going to say this earlier, but I didn't, you know, I think the reason no one's benched over 800 raw is because of injuries Yep. period. Like, I mean, I think there's plenty of people like walking around right now that are capable of bench pressing 800 raw. But what's, what, what the tricky part of the equation gets is, you know, if, like, I mean, how many people have come back from a full pec tear and beat their old best raw, you know, that kind of thing. It, yeah. it just doesn't, it's not real. It right. doesn't happen a lot. So, you know, how many people have, you know, had a shoulder surgery or things like that. So where you can get away with a little more injury on squat and deadlift and probably come back. So that's been the number one thing is um, injury. So I think with the peptides, it's allowed some people, like you said, to save their bodies a little bit. Hence they can push longer. And, you know, cause I, I don't know where the maximum age would be, but most of the best bench pressers I've trained are anywhere from like 34 to 40. That's where they're hitting their, like, and it may be, and it may be go longer. Cause I've had, I've had a guy 42 years old that, uh, bench press 639. Now, do you think that's just like time in accumulating, you know, muscle fiber density and time to accumulate a more efficient nervous system? Do you think that's what it is or, or what, you know, if 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 you if I came to you tomorrow and I was eighteen years old and you did everything right, do you think it would it's just an age thing, or do you think it's just like most people, like we talked about, through their thirties are just built on balls and no brains, um, and then eventually they go, oh, I can get smart about this, and that's when the gains actually start to progress. It's probably a bit of both because most of these people that are are doing this later, they were doing other things earlier. So who's to say if they want to start this eighteen years old right. hunt balls out? I think it's going to be a lot of it's going to be like. Um, you know, to use a non-scientific term, just sort of miles. Yeah. So if you're, you know, let's say you start at 30, well, then you may not hit your best bench to your 43. But if you um, lower like me and you're lifting balls out at 12 years old, you're going to hit it earlier. Yeah, absolutely, man. And you know what? That's why I love collaborating with someone like yourself and man, because honestly, it's guys like you and me that, that are going to change the paradigm of this sport and in bodybuilding, just making people sure. realize that the reason that, you know, the, the average quote unquote average muscle gain is six to eight pounds a year is because your training sucks. 
And the, the reason like people can't put on 50 pounds of your bench press in a year is because your training sucks. <laughs> like I think changing the paradigm and allowing people to save their bodies um, is a massive necessity. And there's a very few guys in the world right now that are kind of leading that conversation. Uh, and it's great that we're able to collaborate, man, because ultimately I strongly believe that if someone went to you earlier and you learned that, you know, you know how to manipulate these stimulus. They learned how to manipulate these stimuli. They wouldn't overtrain. They'd be less likely to tear something. They'd optimize their execution. And all of a sudden, you know, no new records are just flying, flying out. Yeah, because we're not working on any elements or anything. We're not make, we're not paying for past sins type of thing. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so peptides, man, and, and hormone manipulation, um, you know, I, I look at it from a longevity and, and joint health and – um, you know, saving my body perspective now. Um, is there anything that it has become kind of prevalent on your radar that most powerlifters are using, or maybe powerlifters should and could be using that are maybe not, uh, they can be gray, but maybe not hundred percent illegal, uh, that can help them recover and move the needle. Well, what I've, the biggest one I've seen so far is, um, and I, I I'm going to preface this, but I don't think I'm like the biggest expert on, on these peptides. So, is uh, BPC-157 has been the one that people seem to have the most uh, best results with so far. Tell me what that is. Do you know anything about what that is? Is that like strength or is that going to be healing their joints or what's that going to do? Yeah, that's been the one. Um, so that one and um, and, and TB-500 sure. are the ones that seem like the most kind of the best results with. Yeah. I recently did a podcast with a guy um, who is a – uh, biochemistry. Uh, I don't know if he's a PhD, but he—he, uh, he, I think he is actually a PhD. Uh, super bright guy. Talked about all these peptides, and uh, you know, get into some of the the references and uh, the research on how these things actually work. It's really fascinating, man. Just, um, you know, I'm 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 a skeptic at heart. Like I'm always like, yeah, you know, I'm not the guy who's going to be the the test dummy who, um, you know, tries it, tries these things and finds out ten years later that you know, you're building a third eyeball or something. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, not my thing, but, um, listen, I've seen tremendous changes in people's joints and, uh, their perceived pain actually goes down as well from, from my observation is, you know, like, how does that feel? Well, it feels, you know, it's still there, but it's less. Okay. Well, that, that's great. <laughs> right. That's a good start. And how long have these been out for exactly? Well, I first started hearing about them in 2012. Um, that's a, I was gonna say like 2012, 2013 is when I did too. Yeah. Yeah, 11 or 12, maybe. Um, and I obviously, like I said, man, I was never a test dummy during my career. I was a test dummy with like nutrition and training, but I was never a test dummy with like jabbing stuff into my body and like, hey, let's try this now and figure it out later. Um, and even now, I think it's too primitive for me. Um, but I'm very curious. And you know, there's, uh, the more they substantiate research and, and they claim to, to believe that it's going to be less harmful than things like growth hormone and IGF because it's more specific in its action, whereas growth hormone and IGF has a systemic response or a systemic action, which could potentially lead to increased cancer cell growth. These things apparently are very, very um, localized in their actions. So It's just a question of who's making it and stuff. That's the only scary yeah, part. You know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Where's it coming from, right? Yeah, man, <laughs> I'm going the polar opposite direction. I think, you know, trying to, what can I do to optimize my life? And there's nothing to do with you know, being the biggest human being on the planet anymore. Although at one time it was, now it's like, hey man, how can I live to be, you know, a hundred and still be able to do handstands and, you know, funky yoga poses with my, you know, with my family. So that's where my head's Yeah, I'm now. the same way now. It's like, my, yeah, fam I think family definitely changes things. Yeah, man. Um, so where do you think the sport of powerlifting is going? And where do you think, um, yeah, tell me, let's answer that one first. Um, I think the, the sport of powerlifting, um, by and large, is headed in a good direction. So um, I think uh, there's just seems to be more opportunity where they're actually like, um, I mean, so when I competed, there would be like maybe a couple contests that give away a few thousand dollars and stuff. It's kind of cool. You, you know, you have enough money to pay for your trip and go, you know, go to a nice dinner after. Mm -hmm. And that's about that. Now they're actually putting up money and even like meets that didn't have money and stuff are getting a little bit there. So I think, uh, and I think there's so much... Um, competition now to run good meets and i think um a huge plus is also with the internet there so if you obviously you know say you run a meet in texas and there's no air conditioning in august which that's happened before then all of a sudden everybody on the internet knows you run meets with no air conditioning in august <laughs> so i think the internet's um for, for the most part helped because we can find out accurate information so i'd say the quality of meets has gotten better the quality of competitors have gotten better 
the uh, potential prizes for competitors gotten better. And, um, you know, I love the growth because, you know, allowing me to make a, a living doing what I love. So it's, I say it's all pretty much by and large positive direction. Awesome, man. Is there, is there one piece of advice you could give to people who are aspiring powerlifters or who want to be great and not from a perspective of performance, because I think you touched on a lot of those things, but from a perspective of mistakes not to make or ways that they can maybe look at um, optimizing their life uh, or their journey as a powerlifter? Yeah, I think it'd be important to to find a, a mentor because I had a pretty good one early on, um, and then kind of along the ways I've, I tra- I moved all around, trained with various people, which is helpful. But I think if I would have had somebody at those times saying like, "This isn't the best exercise to do," you know, you shouldn't be adding this much weight here. Like, why are you doing these cheat curls so heavy? Like, what are you getting out of this? You know, like I do to other people, mm-hmm. that would have been extremely helpful because um, it's going to be one be hard to be totally objective with yourself. And for two, just someone with more experience, like you said, because like I can talk, you know, I can talk a lot of these kids down now that are just training with pure balls and we can get some intelligent things going and it's going to be very interesting to see where all these records go. So I would say you need to find somebody that has your best interests and knows what they're talking about. Josh, what are the name of your books? I know you've got more than one. Um, I want everyone to go out and um, pick up, particularly the one on mindset sounds awesome right up my alley. And what's your, your strength training books? Okay. So I have a number of uh, different books and, um, the first one uh, you guys may have was called Metroflex Gym, Power Building Basics. Yep. I wrote that one with uh, Brian Dobson, the owner of Metroflex. And all these books are available on Amazon. It's the easiest place to get everything. So um, there's that one. The next was um, a book called um, – I ought to send you this one. You'd probably like this one. It's called Bench Press of Science. Great. And um, that was uh, – that's a lot. So that one has like, for instance, a whole chapter on isometrics, You know, a whole chapter on compensatory acceleration – big focus of that book is like, you know, basically taking advantage of what you have. So if, if you're in a, a cell, a jail cell, or you're stuck living in motel six in some, you know, weird town in Indiana with no gym, here's what you can do with your body. You know, if you have access to weights, here's how you can get stronger, you know, that type of thing. I love it. So it's, it's, and it's a lot of mindset stuff in there. Next was the jailhouse strong, successful mindset manual. Then I have, um, another one on interval training. And I have another one they are called size and strength blueprint. Those are more instead of like, just like the philosophy view behind things. Those are more here are programs to do. You know, if you yeah. want, you know, the science, go look it up on PubMed. If you want to just know what to do, here's what to do. So I'm trying to offer people both. Cause I know there's some people that prefer just being t- told what to do. Then finding one that, on ketogenic dieting, which is more like an, an idiot's guide to ketogenic dieting. Brilliance, man. Um, tell people your website and where they can reach out to you. Okay, my website is uh, joshstrength.com, and on social media, you can find me on uh, Jailhouse Strong on Instagram, Jailhouse Strong on YouTube, and the Josh Strength Method on Facebook. Josh Bryant, thank you so much, man, dude. That's it's a pleasure to have you, and that was amazing information. And I love that you are doing things right and leading people down the right path because Lord knows the fitness industry needs it. So I'm grateful for you, man.